Hey guys, welcome back to Language News with you, and today we're going to be reading one of my favorite books, Ruby Holler. One sec, this, um, a sticker stuck to it. Take that out, and then I'll show you the front cover. Ruby Holler. This is, um, the, so they won an award for the children written literature and i love this book i read it in third grade and i can't wait to read it to you so today we're gonna read the first three chapters and sunny's gonna join us a bit she might come in the screen so sunny want to say hi wait i guess not <laughs> i guess that's yes i don't know So anyway, let's continue with, okay, now Sunil, say hi. Say hi. Okay, so I'm going to let her play with a pencil for now. And let's start. Chapter 1, The Silver Bird. Dice leaned far out of the window, his eyes fixed on a bird flying lazily in the distance. Sun slanted through the clouds above as if a spotlight were aimed on the bird. A silver bird, Dallas thought, a magical silver bird. The bird turned suddenly veering south over the small town of Boxton toward the faded yellow building and the window from which Dallas leaned. Dad stretched his arm out. Here, he called, over here. The, word swoop, the bird swooped toward him and then rose up over the building, high, high into the air. Over the alley and the, over the, alley and the train tracks and the dried up creek, Dallas watched it rise on the air, currents over one brown hill and then another, until it disappeared. He tried to follow it in his mind. He imagined it flying on until it spied a narrow green valley, a scooped out basin with the creek looping and the winding its way through the center, and winding its way through the center. He pictured it swooping down from the sky into this basin in the hills, so this place where cool breezes drifted through the trees and where the creek was so clear that every stone on its bottom was visible. Maybe the silver bird had flown home. Get out of that window, a voice shouted from below. No leaning out of windows. Dallas leaned a little farther out and called down to Mr. Trippet. Did you see that silver bird? Get out of that window or, or you're going to be joining your... Sis, join your sister down here pulling weeds, Mr. Trepid threatened. Dallas by his sister, Flor Florida, including her way along the sidewalk, wrenching clumps of weeds and grass and dirt from the ground. Weeds and weeds and grass and, sorry, um, putrid Weeds, Florida snowed, heaving a clod of heavy dirt over her shoulder, and Dallas watched as a cloud landed on Mr. Trippet's back. And as the man scuttled over to Florida and whacked her on the head, Dallas wished the silver bird would, would return and snare Mr. Trippet and carry him high over the town and then drop him splat in the middle. Okay, guys, so I changed the direction a little so you guys can see the book. Chapter 2, The Boxton Creek Home. Boxton was a tired town, a neglected place that looked as if it was in danger of collapsing on in on itself. A tangle of old homes and tracks clustered around a small store clustered around small stores and buildings that had seen better days. One of these buildings was the Boxing Creek Home for Children, a ramshackle house that tilted toward the train tracks and hills beyond. In this building lived the bungling 
managers, Mr. and Mrs. Trumpet, their sister Morgan, and 13 children raging in age, in, in age from 6 months to 13 years. The two oldest children in Boxing Creek home were twins, Dallas and Florida. They were tall for their age, dark-haired and dark-eyed with sturdy frame, and rough-edged and unkept look out them look about them. Dallas was the quieter one of the two and the one more inclined and the one more inclined to daydreaming. While Florida was loud and squirmy with her with her mouth full of words bursting out and her face full of expression flashing from surprise to di- to from surprise to disgust and in an instant. The managers of the home, Mr. and Mrs. Trumpet, were middle-aged, cranky and tired, and growing stiff and cold as winter-bound trees. They believed in rules, and their rules were posted on doorways, and in the hallways, and above each child's bed. There were general rules and kitchen rules, bathroom rules, and stairway rules, basement rules, and outside rules, upstairs rules, and downstairs rules, clothing rules, washing rules, cleaning rules, rules upon rules upon rules. If we didn't have rules, Mr. Trumpet liked to say, everything would be chaos. If we didn't have rules, his wife would say, these children would eat us alive. Since Dallas and Florida had lived in the Boxing Creek home longer than any of the other children, they knew all the rules. They also knew the punishment of disobeying the rules, and they knew them well, because they had broken every rule in Boxing Creek home. Many times, how can we live every day of our lives without running or shouting or throwing? Or talking or dropping or spilling, Dad said once asked Mr. Trippet, thinking corner two hours. Mr. Trippet replied, as he sat in the dark corner of the basement, Dallas imagined a broad field rimmed with trees, and in that imaginary field, he ran, shouted, and threw sticks and mud. And when he was tired, he lay down in the green grass and felt himself getting smaller and smaller until he was a baby lying in the grass and someone with the sweet face leaned down and wrapped him in a white blanket. While Florida was caught breaking one of the rules, she was more likely to argue and as a result to an extra punishment, she could not sit still, could not walk with her feet wanting, could not walk when her feet wanted to run. And so, on a fairly regular basis, she'd be ru- she'd be running down the hall, and Mrs. Trepid's long, skinny arm would dart out from a doorway, snare Florida, and re- lead her to the nearest copy of the rules. What does that say, Mr. Trep- Miss Trepid demanded? Florida squinted at the sign. No stupid running. It does not say that said Mrs. Trepid. It does not say that, Mrs. Trepid said urgently, urging, sorry, Florida's face close to the sign, read it again. No one is thinking stupid running. Down to the basement, two hours in the thinking corner. That's stupid. Followed by two hours of floor scrub, scrubbing, putrid. Followed by two hours of weed pulling. Dallas and Florida had backed up hundreds of hours in the thinking corner. The damp, dark, cobwebbed corner of the basement. They had worn the scratchy, I've been bad shirts. Shoveled manure crawled across acres of fields, pulling weeds. They also peeled potatoes, scrubbed pots and floors, washed windows and hold boxes and broken furniture. Good hard thinking and good hard working and good hard work. Never hurt anybody, Mr. Trippet would say. Mr. Mr. Trippet, who was a short, squat man with an awkward walk like a crab scuttling across the ocean floor, did not particularly like thinking or working himself, but he firmly believed that these were good things for children 
The home was a misfit operation lost over the years in a larger system. Funds dribbled in, but social workers no longer came to check on the children. Health workers and building inspectors no longer came to inspect the building. There was no longer a doctor or a staff or secretarial help. It was run slowly by the trepids. Sol- solely. I have no idea to pronounce that, guys. Um, by the trepids. With the help of their overworked assistant. Morgan, who referred to herself as a chief graffer. Still, the Boxing Creek home was as much at a home as Dallas and Florida knew. On the front of the building, faded yellow paint curled in strips like peeling skin behind the main building. A string of smaller cubes had been added to a cricked path out the back. Dallas thought it looked like a string of mismatched box cars and box cars laid end to end. At Ford, I thought it looked like a dragon with its huge mouth at the front door waiting to swallow up children who entered it. When children first came to Boxton Creek home, they stayed, sorry guys, they sunny no, no biting paper, go, sorry. When children first came to Boxing Creek home, they stayed in one of the bigger rooms in front. But gradually, as the months and years went by, if they'd not been placed and elsewhere, they were shunted farther and farther back to the dark, low ceilinged, airless rooms at the tail of the house. Rotation, Mr. Trepid called it. Rota- rotation. Children came and went. Some were taken in by foster families or adopted. A few ran away but were in- inevitably returned. One died in his bed whispering, Who am I? Who am I? And although Mr. and Mrs. Trippett had tried their best to move Dallas and Florida out, or rather, as Mrs. Trippett explained to them, to explain it to them, to find you a lovely home. The twins were always bought, brought back to the big front door by ex- expirated adults. Trouble twins, these ex- expirated adults would say, nothing but trouble. In turn, Des and Florida had come to think of most adults as trouble grown-ups. For that had been their experience that most grown-ups they'd encountered were short-tempered, impatient, and quick to punish. They had no way of knowing that there were foster parents and adopting parents who were kind and loving and generous and forgiving. In the narrow world of Dallas and Florida, an adult was someone to escape. Over the years, Dallas and Florida had been squeezed toward the back of the Boxing Creek home until they'd come to the end of it, where two cubicles Huddled side by side, and each was a narrow, lumpy bed, a slim dresser ramped up close to the bed and a closet. A single bare bulb dangled from each ceiling. At night, Dallas Dallas and Florida listened to the wail of freight trains making their way through Boxton and on to, to where? To other places far and wide, to beautiful places, peaceful ones, friendly ones. Des and Florida had a plan. They would not be in Boxing Creek home forever. They were going to jump on the night freight train and ride out of town soon. Chapter 3, Ruby Holler. 20 miles away from Boxing was Ruby Holler, a lush green hidden valley with the cabin at the far end was inhabited by a man who lived on his own and who kept to himself in the cabin in the middle of the holler. Lived a 60-year-old man and his wife. One warm morning in June, the man and his wife sat on the porch swing. Same old view, the man grumbled. Same old sagging porch. Same old creaky swing. You're pretty grouchy this morning, said his wife. I'm tired of hauling wind, water and chopping wood. Do you think people are right then? His wife asked. Should we move? 
get a condo somewhere, have electricity and heat, a, a washing machine and one of those air conditioner things. Husband nodded, and a television maybe, and a garage with one of those automatic doors. That sure would be different, his wife said. It sure would, the man agreed. A small gray bird swooped down from the sky and landed on the porch railing. It cocked its head at the couple as if it were listening to them. So that was it for chapter uh, one to three. Um, in the next video, I'm going to read you chapter four to six. So see you next time. Bye.